agent of the will energy of the soul is released and rightly directed by the mind, then disease can be handled and brought eventually to an end. It is therefore by the imposition of a higher energy and of a higher rhythm upon the lower forces that disease can be controlled. Disease is therefore the result in the physical body of the failure to bring in these higher energies and rhythms, and that, in its turn, is dependent upon the point in evolution. It is the dim sensing of this failure and the realization of these facts that has brought so many groups to believe in the cure of disease by thought power and to ascribe the appearance of disease. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 57 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing To Wrong Thinking but in reality, humanity must someday learn that it is only the higher consciousness of the soul, working through the mind, that can finally solve this difficult problem. We cannot consequently affirm that disease, as a general rule, has any relation to thought. It is simply the misuse of the forces of the etheric, the astral and of the dense physical level. The majority of people are helpless to do anything about it, as the forces which constitute the physical body, for instance, and which pass through and play upon it, are inherited from a very ancient past, are a constituent part of the environment and of the group life into which they are integrated and which they share with all their fellowmen. Such force matter is colored with the results of ancient wrong rhythms, misused forces and inherited qualities. Soul energy, expressed through right thinking, can cure diseases to which man is prone. It is failure to think and to register and express the higher states of consciousness which leads to wrong rhythms. Consequently, I repeat that disease is not the result of thought. C. Frustrated Idealism There are, however, certain diseases which appear in the physical mechanism and which are definitely rooted in the fact that activity, which is the result of thinking specifically, has been colored and conditioned by the emotional life of the individual, and the emotional life is a fruitful source of disease and of establishing wrong rhythms. It is therefore the predominance of the astral force, and not of the mental energy, which really causes the physical trouble. I am not referring here to the diseases of the nervous system and of the brain, which are the result of overstimulation and of the impact of energy, often from the mind and the soul, upon an instrument unfitted to handle it. These we will consider later. I refer simply to the following sequence of events in the psychological life and the consequent resultant activity. Disease is a form of activity. 1. Mental activity and energy produces, through the power of thought, certain registration of plans, idealisms and ambitions. 2. This energy, blended with astral energy, becomes dominated and controlled by astral reactions of an undesirable kind, such as worry over non-accomplishment, the failure to materialize the plan, etc. The life becomes consequently embittered. 3. Disease then appears in the physical body, according to the predisposing tendencies of the body and its inherent, inherited weaknesses. You will note that, in reality, the mental body, and the power of thought, have in no case been the cause of trouble. It has been caused by the obliteration of the original thought and its stepping. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 58 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 
esoteric healing down to the level of emotionalism when this stepping down and eventual control by astral forces does not take place and the thought remains clear and untouched upon the mental plane there may be trouble of another kind due to a failure to carry through the thought into effective action upon the physical plane this failure produces not only the cleavage in the personality so well known to the practicing psychologist, but also a cutting off of a much needed stream of energy. As a consequence, the physical body is devitalized and falls heir to bad health. When the thought can be carried through to the physical brain and there becomes a directing agent of the life force, you will usually have a condition of good health, and this has proved true whether the individual thought has been good or bad, rightly motivated or wrongly oriented. It is simply the effect of integration, for the saints and sinners, the selfish and the unselfish and all kinds of people, can achieve integration in a thought-directed life. The second question asks whether an individual or a group can heal by thought power. Most certainly the generalization can be made that an individual and a group can heal and that thought can play its potent part in the healing process, but not thought alone and unaided. Thought can be the directing agency of forces and energies which can disrupt and dispel disease, but the process must be aided by the power to visualize, by an ability to work with particular forces as is deemed advisable, by an understanding of the rays and their types of energies, and also by a capacity to handle light substance, as it is called. To these powers must be added the ability to be on rapport with the one to be healed, plus a loving heart. In fact, once these conditions are met, too much use of the thinking faculty and too potent the use of the mind processes can arrest and hinder the healing work. Thought has to condition the initial incentive, bringing the intelligence of the man to bear upon the problem of healing and the comprehension of the nature of the one to be healed, but once it has aided in focusing the attention of the healer and the healing group, it should become a steady but subconscious directed agent and nothing more than that. The healing is accomplished, when possible, by the use of energy rightly directed and by detailed visualization. Love also plays a great part, as does the mind in the early stage. Perhaps I should say that a loving heart is one of the most potent of all the energies employed. I have brought these two questions to your attention because I am anxious for your minds to be clear upon these problems before you start any group work in healing. God neither cures disease nor causes it. God must be employed in the processes, but it is not the soul or the most important agent. It is on this point that many groups and healers go astray. The mind can direct energy and this energy can, in its turn, produce overstimulation of the brain and of the body cells and so cause nervous trouble and sometimes brain disease, but the mind itself and thinking, per se, cannot cause disease and trouble in the physical body. As the race learns to think clearly and definitely, and as the laws of thought begin to control the racial. Copyright Copyright 1998 Rules of Trust 59 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Consciousness, disease, as we now know it will be greatly lessened and more and more people will achieve integration. Where there is integration there is the free play of force and of energy throughout the material body. The problems of stimulation will, however, 
steadily increased with the growing sensitivity of the physical man and the developing focus of his consciousness in the mind nature. This will go on until man learns how to handle the higher energies and to recognize the need for a rhythmic life, paying attention to the law of periodicity. In healing work, certain rules should be mastered and followed by the healer. I have given three important rules already. Briefly they are as follows, and I am dividing the first one into its component parts for the sake of clarity. 1. A. The healer must take the link his soul, his heart, his brain, and his hands. Thus can he pour the vital force with healing power upon his patient. This is magnetic work. P. The healer must take the link his soul, his brain, his heart and auric emanation. Thus can his presence be the soul life of the patient. This is the work of radiation. The hands are needed not. The soul displays its power. 2. The healer must achieve magnetic purity, true purity of life. He must achieve the dispelling radiance which shows itself in every man once he has linked the centers in the head. When this magnetic field has been established, the radiance then goes forth. 3. Let the healer train himself to know the inner stage of thought or of desire of the one who seeks his help. He can thereby know the source from which the trouble comes. Let him relate the cause and the effect, and know the point exact through which relief must come. I would here give you, as a group, another rule, making four major rules. Rule 4. The healer and the healing group must keep the will in leash. It is not will that must be used, but love. This last rule is of great importance. The concentrated will of any individual and the directed will of a united group should never be employed. The free will of the individual must never be subjected to the impact of a powerfully focused group or individual, it is far too dangerous a procedure to be permitted. Will energy particularly that of a number of people simultaneously playing upon the subtle and physical bodies of the one to be healed can greatly increase the trouble instead of curing it. It can stimulate the disease itself to dangerous proportions and disrupt instead of cooperating with nature's healing forces, and can even eventually kill the person concerned by so increasing the disease that the patient's normal resistance can prove futile. I would ask you, therefore, in any group work of healing, to keep the will and even keen. Copyright Copyright 1998 Rules of Trust 60. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 4, Esoteric Healing Desire in abeyance. Only initiates of high degree are permitted to cure by the power of the will, focus in the word of power, and this only because they can test the capacity of the patient, the tension of the disease, and know also whether or no it is the will of the soul that the disease should be cured. We have covered much ground of importance in this section and it will warrant your careful study. In the next one we will take up the peculiar problems of the disciple. I would ask you, in preparation for this, to study with attention the teaching which I gave earlier on the diseases of the mystic. Three much said there need not be repeated by me, but should be incorporated in our teachings on healing. I suggest that you read them and know something of the problem. Themselves, both theoretically and from an understanding of yourself. You should be aware of some of these difficulties in your own experience, at least to some degree. The Sacred Art of Healing I do not intend, in this treatise, 
to deal with the pathology of disease, with its systems and their maleficent indications. These are fully covered in a